What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Please hit that subscribe button right now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another mafia topic and throughout the life of John Gotti Sr. and John Gotti Jr., there may not have been a bigger thorn in the sides of those two than today's subject. Daniel Marino is the son of a mob member. He would ultimately become very high ranking and would play a very interesting part in the life and legacies of the Gottis. It would ultimately lead us to wonder, was John Gotti Jr. a mob informant? The story of Danny Marino next on Sit Down Shorts. Daniel Marino was born October 7, 1940 in Brooklyn, New York. Interestingly enough, he was actually the son of Gaetano Marino. Gaetano Marino was identified by the FBI in 1965 as a member of the Genovese crime family. Now, in that report as well, it would also state that he was from Sicily, his father, and that he had been a member of that family. Now, the young Marino would follow his father's footsteps into the mob. By the early 70s, he had become a rising star in the Gambino family. Paul Castellano would take note and would see that the young Marino was an interesting and probably down the road a leader for the family. He would come up in the construction and labor racketeering markets and make money and become a major earner in that group. Now, in the early 70s, he would become inducted into the family. And by this point, as I said, he was very close and had a eye to the boss, Paul Castellano, or one of the bosses of the family, Paul Castellano. As we know, Carlo Gambino um, would pass away and he would give control of the family to Paul Castellano. A lot of people weren't happy with that, including John Gotti, who thought that his mentor and the underboss of the family, Neil De La Croce, should have the top spot. Now, for Danny Marino, this was a great piece of news. By this point, he was very close with Castellano. He also become very close with this individual, mob powerhouse, and one of the most underrated people in the American mafia, James Failure. Now, Failure was the king of garbage in New York and was one of the most powerful people in the family. Now, as the 80s would play out, as we know, it's very publicized. John Gotti would plan the assassination of his predecessor, Paul Castellano. Now, there were a few people that were not fans or did not want this to go down, and they were loyalists of Castellano, Faglia, and Marino. Now, in 1985, Castellano would go as well as Tommy Bellotti, and it would happen to be interesting what would go on after the fact. Gotti would take over control, and he would name an individual called Frank DeChico the underboss. He would kind of seize control of many of the rackets that Paul was in charge of, and I think between the lines, that angered James Failure and Daniel Marino. As we know, Failure was very close with members of the Genovese crime family, including the boss, Chin Giganti. Now, in April of 1986, Jimmy Failure would summon uh, Frankie DeChico to his club, the Veteran Friend Social Club on 86th Street in Brooklyn. And upon leaving the club, DeChico's car would blow up and he would die at the seat. Now, in 1995, Anthony Casso decided to flip uh, on the mafia. He would say in a report that, according to him, that Marino and Felia very much knew about the plot to kill Frank DeChico. Um, now, whether we believe him or not, that is still up for contention. Now, it is interesting to realize that uh, once DeChico went, um, that made, obviously, it a lot better for uh, Felia and Danny Marino. Now, Another point of uh, emphasis we know about is that in 1990, John Gotti, Frankie Lacasio, and Sammy Gravano would all be arrested and would go to prison. Now, um, in 1993, things would start to fall apart for James Failure and Daniel Marino. In, 19, uh, in the early 90s, Sammy Gravano would uh, begin to start to tell the government his secrets, and he would implicate... Marino and Failure in the 1989 murder of an individual called Thomas Spinelli. Spinelli was um, part of the mob, and he uh, 
uh, had went in front of a grand jury. The mob believed he was a rat and Sammy Gravano would order him dead. Failure and Marino would be in control of taking care of that piece of work. And Gravano would implicate Failure and Marino in that plot. Ultimately, Failure would get a prison sentence and die in 1999. But Marino would head to jail and face his first prison stint uh, after he was given a long sentence uh, for that conspiracy to kill Tommy Spinelli. By this point, as he goes to prison, Gotti goes away and Junior Gotti assumes control of the Gambino crime family. Now, this was good, though, for um, failure because he was still somewhat in control. He was part of a ruling body uh, in the early 90s that would control the family. Gotti Sr. knew he needed to make people like failure happy. He was one of those old school guys, and he was an important part of the decision-making process, though. Ultimately, the family would be in control of Gotti Jr. Now, upon his release in 2000, Daniel Marino would head right back to the streets. Uh, once a criminal, always a criminal. By this point, he's 60 years old, and he goes back to the only thing he knows well, the mafia. And as we also know, in the early 2000s, the government would continue their crusade against John Gotti Jr. He would face trials many different times. But in 2005, we're going to discuss a situation that many people always wonder about when we talk about the mob. In 2005, John Jr. Gotti would sit in front of the federal government. He would agree to a proffer session where he would lay out some thoughts about his emissaries. Now, there has been a lot of talks on YouTube and other mediums about whether John Gotti is an informant or not. I am going to talk about this from a fact standpoint. I'm going to talk about what came out in that proffer session, and it'll be your job to ultimately decide what you think of John Jr. Gotti. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because most of the information discussed in this proffer session had to do with Daniel Marino. Now, there was no love lost between Junior Gotti and Marino. It was said that for years they did not like each other. And at one point, um, there was actually something that would come out in Junior's trial that at one point, Junior actually tried to have Marino killed. Um, now, that was never ultimately uh, something that would that would be proven true, but there was no love lost between the two. And the Gotti thorn was Marino for a long time. Now, in that proffer session, it would actually center around some talk that Gotti would make in that session that he would come out ultimately say was bullshit. But he would discuss the murder of this individual, Jim James Jimmy Heidel, who it's important to understand was the nephew of Dan Marino. Now, as we know, uh, Jimmy Heidel would be killed by Anthony Casso and his group of mafia cops uh, in the 80s after Casso was uh, shot at and almost died. It was said that uh, the order came from the Gambino family and that Heidel was one of the members involved. He would ultimately be figured out. They would find him and they would torture him. According to Gotti, he would put Marino's name into the fact that he had to give approval Marino to have Heidel killed because Heidel was his nephew and that the ruling body of the family came to him and asked him, is it okay that we take care of Jimmy Heidel? Now, again, it's important to understand, according to Gotti Jr., this was all, quote, bullshit. He would also involve Joe Watts, John Gamarano, who was Marino's protege, and other mafia members. The question I have for people that do not believe Junior was a rat, and they will contend that, well, Junior Gotti didn't put anyone in prison for his testimony. That may be fair. However, first of all, why was he in front of the uh, FBI to begin with? What was the decision that was made there? What, what was the ultimate goal of doing that? And let's be honest, you name names, not like you sat there and denied everything. You sat there and picked people out and put them into crimes that they may or may not have been involved in. Again, all I do is talk about what truly happened, okay? That's what happened. That's what the proper session clearly states. It's not like we're arguing that. It's come out. It's out there. You can find the memorandum. It's all out there on the internet. You can look it up for yourself. Um, so the question I have is, why was Junior Gotti in front of the FBI to begin with? Let's ask ourselves this question. What would his father have thought of that decision? According to one gangland source, according to gangland news, he would quote say that Junior Gotti's proper session was no different than the cooperation of Mikey Scars and Sammy Gravano. 
according to that individual, all of them are informants. Now, as we know, Gotti Jr. would retire from the mob and leave. Now, that would not stop Daniel Marino from discussing Junior Gotti and his behavior. As I said, there was no love lost between Danny Marino and John Junior Gotti. In a wired conversation between him and this individual, Louis Kassman, a Gotti confidant who had at one point been called the adopted son of Gotti. He was a family friend. In a taped conversation between Marino and Kassman, Marino would lament about Junior Gotti, quote, the kid sent word that the kid, Junior, is annoyed, that nobody helped him. Quote, I don't understand. I'm shocked that he would even say that. Who the fuck is he? Question mark. We don't agree with what he did. He knows that. He knows it better than anybody. If he had acted that way, his father would have liked him to act. Fuck him. Now, again, no love lost between Gotti Jr. and Marino. Now, as I said, Gotti would contend that the stuff that he said during the proper session wasn't true. Then again, why did he sit down with them to begin with? That's our question. For Marino, though, in 2010, he would go away again. In 2010, he would be indicted by the FBI alongside 13 co-defendants seen here up in the top right in a wide-ranging racketeering indictment. Charges would include conspiracy to commit murder, extortion, assault, sex trafficking, and more. And the government would contend that Marino was the skipper of all of these people. This individual, Thomas Orfisi, uh, would be indicted involving multiple crimes, including extortion, illegal gambling, and sex trafficking of a minor. The government would contend that these members of Marino's crew set up a prostitution sting on Craigslist involving women as young as 15 years old. Now, they would also contend that Johns would pay these girls over Craigslist for sex. They would then cut it in half, give the girls some, and the rest of the money would go back to the mob. Now, it is probably led to believe that most of the members either did not know that this girl was 15. I'm not excusing the behavior. This is gutless, sickening behavior on the the uh, topic of Orifici. Now, they would ultimately be arrested and charged and plead, plead guilty to all these crimes. Marino, though, would face a different uh, crime. He would be indicted for conspiracy to commit murder of Jimmy Heidel's brother, Frank Heidel. According to the FBI, in 1997, they would say that Marino would approve the murder of Frankie Heidel on the grounds that he was an informant. In 1998, Frank Heidel's body would be found in the parking lot of a Staten Island strip club. Danny Marino would plead guilty uh, and get uh, 60 months in prison for conspiracy to commit murder in the case of Frank Heidel. So the government basically just says, we don't know if we can actually prove this, but We'll give you a little sentence. That way you don't have to go for life and you go to jail and you're old anyway. So maybe you'll die and that will be that. He wouldn't die, though. Danny Marino would be released in 2014. Currently, he's 81 years old. It's unclear and unknown what Danny Marino is up to now. The truth of the matter is he is likely living out the rest of his golden years in relative anonymity. But make no case about it. From the birth in 1940 of Daniel Marino, his blood oozes Cosa Nostra. He has been around the life really since he was a child. And once a gangster, always a gangster. We haven't heard much from Danny since. We did hear one thing, though, uh, from the Marino family. According uh, to the FBI, the sins of his father would plague uh, the son of um, Danny Marino, uh, Daniel Marino Jr., uh, in Late 2016, early 2017, he would be involved in a plot in South Florida involving mob rat John Rubio. According to the feds, through different Costa Nostra families, Rubio is a bookmaker and that he would regularly have conversations with Daniel Marino. The problem was he was wired for sound. Uh, Marino would never bet or be involved in collection of gambling debts. However, he would be seen and heard talking to Rubio about his crimes. Now, I ultimately felt bad for Marino Jr. It seemed like he was just being picked on by the government due to his relations uh, and who his father was. Um, a lot of the time, the federal government will make me sons and family members of these people uh, pay the price. 
uh, for uh, their crimes. Now, according to the case, um, Marino in 2014, Marino Jr. would have lunch with the person who operated the sports betting business. We could claim that that would be Rubio. And Marino would claim that a close friend of his owed a gambling debt and that he agreed to speak to my friend to see if the debt could be resolved. So according to the government, he was aiding the sports betting business and he would ultimately have to face a judge in that case. Now, we have to wonder if that were anyone else, just a regular person on the street, they may not even be brought in the case. But Daniel Marino was the son of a very powerful individual that, for the most part, uh, spurned the federal government, never truly went to jail. Daniel Marino will likely die in his own bed. A fascinating life. As I said, it is widely thought that Daniel Marino is one of the major thorns in the sides of not only John Gotti Sr., but John Gotti Jr. And the question we have to ponder as this video ends, if you were a fan or someone that loves mob history, consider yourself a historian, ask yourself this, why was the sitting head of an American mafia family ever sitting in front of the FBI to begin with? It's the question we ponder. As always, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, make sure you like and subscribe. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.